Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Help Me Believe, the show about Christian apologetics and theology. My name is Hayden Clark, your host, and I'm excited to introduce my special guest to you. His name is Tom Gilson. Tom, how are you doing today, sir? I'm well, thanks. Well, I appreciate uh, you joining me today for the interview. I'm sure I'm looking forward to it. Um, I've kept up with your writing and things like that for a while. And, of course, I was uh, tickled to death one day when I got an email from you asking if you want, if you could publish one of my articles uh, over there at your website, The Stream. And so I, um, right. I've been wanting to have you on for a while, and so this is going to be fun. Uh, but for the audience members who may or may not be familiar with who you are, I thought it might be helpful if you give us a brief introduction. Okay. Yeah. I... Um... Where do I begin? I'm a, I'm a Michigan native. I'm living in Ohio. I went to Michigan State, which is not as bad as being a Michigan grad living in Ohio, but <laughs> I live in Dayton, Ohio. Um, married, um, got two grown kids, grown married kids, a couple grand dogs, uh, grand cat, grand bunnies, but no grandkids yet. But um, I, uh, I served with Campus Crusade for Christ crew for 34 years doing things, everything from music to web design to human resource leadership to strategies. And along the way, I kept studying apologetics. And uh, you know, uh, it's been a lifelong love. And I came to Christ as a freshman at Michigan State. It was largely through reading and then very soon afterwards um, hearing the, uh, the work of Josh McDowell. And um, from then on, I've just had a love for it. And uh, about, I guess, 15 years ago, I started blogging at a site called Thinking Christian, thinkingchristian.net. And that developed into some other writing, some other strategy opportunities. And along the way, I've worked with Chuck Colson a couple of years on, on, on the uh, Breakpoint team, have um, written for First Things, have uh, published several books from uh, one that I edited called True Reason, Confronting the Irrationality of the New Atheism, A Christian Mind, which is Thoughts on Life and Truth in Jesus Christ, Critical Conversations, A Christian Parent's Guide to Discussing Homosexuality with Teens. And um, I'll skip a couple, but right now I am just uh, sent to the editor a, a new manuscript that's titled Too Good to be False, uh, surprising ways Jesus story can strengthen your faith and it's got a new argument it's an old argument but it hasn't been touched since the 19th century as far as I've been able to find a new argument for the historicity of the Gospels and mm -hmm. it's really based on the greatness of Jesus so that was a fun one to write I work now uh, my day job is I write and edit and I'm a senior editor uh, for the stream which is a national daily website that presents a uh, a kingdom perspective, a Christian perspective on current events, and we're we're a multi-staff member team. We have some really great writers there. I think it is the go-to site for that Christian perspective on current events, even though they let me write there. <laughs> so uh, it's a real privilege to be involved with that as well. That's at stream.org, by the yeah. way. And it is a it's a great website to keep up with. I do. Um keep up with uh, a lot of the writings that go on over there. I really like it. I wasn't aware of it until I got an email from you uh, one day asking mm -hmm. if you could pu if you could publish the article over there and, and then that kind of got me into doing some research and seeing what the stream was. Um, but you should definitely check that out. We'll leave a link in the description as well as a link to um, Tom's bio as well as those books he mentioned. We'll leave a link in the description for those. Um, so you didn't become a Christian until you were in college. Is that what you said? That's right. Yeah, I, I was raised in a Christian home. I tried really hard to be a Christian. Um, for those who have actually discovered the gospel, as I came to find out, you can't do that. Right. You can't try to become a Christian and succeed. I was very, very frustrated with it, and I gave up on it. When I went to college, I met a couple of guys who were living the Christian life and seemed to be enjoying it, and I got really intrigued and at that, and they shared the gospel with me. It was actually uh, 45 years ago last Sunday that I prayed to receive Christ. Yeah. So just hit a, a milestone there. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, you mentioned uh, Josh McDowell. Um, right. How, how did his ministry affect your coming to Christ, or at least uh, strengthening your faith in that way? Yeah, well, in the, in the in the period when I was trying to figure out whether this all made sense before I accepted Christ, my uh, two friends there gave me a copy of his book, which was fairly new at the time, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. This was back in late 1974 at that point. And um, 
I read it, I devoured, I thought, my goodness, this is actually true. This isn't just something that they, uh, you know, stories that I learned in church. Um, this isn't just some cultural thing. This is, this is really true. And so that was really influential to me in, in being confident in what I was diving into. Now, um, right after I accepted Christ, I started, uh, I, I thought that the reason everybody else wasn't a Christian is because they hadn't read evidence that demands a verdict. So I started <laughs> in immediately sharing it around the dorm, and my next door neighbor slammed his door so hard on me I can still feel it um, mm. on the sore spot on my nose. Turns out it's not just apologetics. I, I discovered that very quickly. But right after I became a Christian, um, that was January 75, in probably March, Josh came to Michigan State for a series of talks that was hosted by Campus Crusade for Christ. And the and the Campus Crusade, I mean, it's called Crew now, but I'm still used to Campus Crusade for the name. Um, the, the students there and the staff did it right, especially with prayer. And the uh, the prayer coordinator was the one of the two who led me to Christ. And, and there was an awful lot of momentum. There was a lot of excitement around Josh coming, and there was a lot of prayer. And then there was a lot of really good teaching. And what that did is it launched me right away into a real vision of what Christianity could be like. Prayer, excitement, momentum, people coming to Christ, people pulling together. And, and it was a great launch, and I, I think it made a big difference for me that's, that's lasted to this day. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, apologetics played a, a big role in in my um, staying in the faith. So I became a Christian mostly because of an experience I had in Lubbock, Texas while I was in college. And then while I was in seminary, I actually began to have a lot of sh struggles with the intellectual side and was basically on the on the precipice of leaving. I, was, I remember laying in bed one night and thinking, tomorrow I have to go to church because I was working at a church and, and tell my pastor— I, I just don't believe anymore, and maybe I'll come back, but right now I just I don't believe anymore. Wow. Um, and then that's whenever, I, I don't know why, but I decided, well, I guess I should actually be sure of this and better look into it, and I didn't even know what apologetics was. I barely even knew what hmm. seminary was before I went to seminary. I was just okay. uh, just a very young Christian, and, and very quickly my faith started to deteriorate that way. But mm -hmm. um, it, it's funny, but once I did, just like you were talking about, when I did discover what apologetics was, and it just revived me to think this isn't yeah. just a good story. I wasn't lied to. I wasn't lying to myself, which you kind of know deep down, but you're like, how do I? I can't prove it, though. And so that's kind of right. what apologetics provided for me. And yeah. then I thought, if everybody knew this, they would become Christians, yeah. like you're right, saying. Right, right, right. You know, yeah. you know, I, didn't, I didn't go knock on anybody's doors, but yeah. And, and really what I was mm -hmm. actually thinking, because I was very big on evangelism, and I remember when I was a young Christian reading uh, David Platt on the unreached and things like that, and there's so many people mm -hmm. that haven't heard even Jesus' name, and I just thought, if, if, if Christians, people who call themselves Christians, saw this evidence for God and Jesus— that it would revive them and we would actually come together and do stuff like that. I think I think apologetics really has um, can persuade can be very persuasive not just for skeptics but for people who call themselves Christians also. I think so too. And and even though I had that negative experience trying to share my faith, what that was was God telling me it's it's the Holy Spirit. It's not just words on the page. Right. Um, but I, I yeah the. Uh, Dallas Willard said something like this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher the quote, but he said something like the uh, the, the the vast uh, the, the great majority or something of uh, Christians uh, suffer under the 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 worry the the, the uh, that among those who are in the know the faith has been found out to be foolish. Mm, yeah. You know, that's in the Divine Conspiracy. I wish I had the exact quote, but yeah, not, yeah. I think that. I think that's true that that we just wonder if you know you know if we if I really knew then I'd know okay this is all just uh, you know playing with games um, that can't help but weaken your faith right that can't help but make you feel just a little bit unsure about God if you're sure about God for whatever reason maybe He's going to give you some incredible experience with Him and I and I I wouldn't mind you know having that happen to me. Um, and it has, yeah. But there's an intellectual side to it too. 
there's there's a fact based side to it too that that I think that if we had a good handle on that would really strengthen our faith it would strengthen the church it would and and you know we are in a period now where writing on the stream we are we do our best to stay very much in touch with this we are in a period of increasing anti-christian hostility and we are in a period when more and more christians in various ways are going to be um, asking themselves the question am i ready to follow jesus no matter what mm -hmm. well you know if you know jesus is true no matter what it's a lot easier to follow him no matter right, what yeah so you know just speaking about that dual aspect of the experience versus the intellectual side of things mm -hmm. I can yeah. say I can say 100% wholeheartedly that the the times that I have been most devoted to following Christ and um, living out spiritual disciplines, if we just want to use that as an example, so the times when I've just been most on fire to dive into God's Word, to to evangelize and to pray and things like that, were right after I became a Christian, and I became a Christian because of. Uh, experience that I just really I'm not very charismatic myself I grew up in the Baptist church but this was just mm -hmm. so undeniable that I was like fell okay. down on my face and repented and that was when I was most on fire for God and then also mm -hmm. in the second or you know another time when I, when I was most on fire for following Christ was after I got into apologetics and so that just seems like yeah. you can you can have this experience and it's fantastic and there's also this intellectual side that is also very stimulating as far as yep. being and so I think probably and most Christians or serious Christians who think about these things would say that one of the biggest things that we face in the church is just um, complacency or yep. apathy. Apathy, Christians who are pretty apathetic. It's like, uh, you know, we go to church on Sunday, mm -hmm. but, you know, six days, of, the other six days of the week, it's not much going on. And I think right. apologetics can really hit, um, be effective in that way, too. So, um right. That's why. That's why here at Help Me Believe we say strengthen the believer and answer the critic. And a, and a lot of times we're we're just strengthening believers, and I'm fine with that too. Preaching to yep, the choir. I, think I heard a, I sure. heard a Christian musician one time say, uh, people accuse me of because he deals, does a lot of concerts at churches and stuff like that, and he's just preaching to the choir. And he said, yeah, but the choir's broken, so I'm fine with that. And I've kind of adopted that. And it was pretty I cheesy. Like that. yeah, it was pretty cheesy, but I was yeah. like, wow, that, that's pretty true. I was like, I'm fine with apologetics being aimed at Christians. Because I think yeah. we need it too. So you become a Christian um, while in college, and uh, Josh McDowell had a lot to do um, with that and and and, and right. his uh, approach to apologetics and crew, which is an, an organization that often gets brought up whenever I have these interviews. I just started noticing that it's very cool. Um, mm -hmm. Is there is there is there ever a time when you have um, serious doubts, and uh, how did you deal with them? I've never gone through that. Um, um, you know, I've, it, it, it was true. It still is true. Oh. And, um, you know, I've gone through some, some really rotten stuff as a believer. You know, one of the things that helped me was studying church history. Because um, when I went through... Um, for example, in, in our church in Virginia, uh, while my kids, especially my son, were in youth group, our, our youth minister, our youth pastor, got arrested, and he's in serving federal time now for misbehaving with minors. That was awful. Yeah. It was it was horrific experience for the whole youth group, um, for me, because he was my friend, for our son. Um, but I knew that God had survived that kind of a thing already, because I'd read their church history. Right. And, and God can survive my own mistakes, of which there are enough. And yeah. um, and so I think having that foundation of just understanding some of the the, 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 uh, the truth of the faith and and the, the history of, of the church and uh, being able to put it in a larger context that um, had another, I won't go into it, but another very difficult church experience about two years ago. And my wife was in this meeting with me and we walked out and I said, well, you know, that's a, this story's been on going on for centuries. We're just another chapter in it. We're okay. Yeah. And because Jesus died on the cross for us, we're okay. Because he rose again, we're way more than okay. Yeah. It's okay. And yeah. um, and for some reason, that since I came to faith in Christ, I've never had to really question it. 
Yeah, probably probably in the because of the way in which you came to Christ and, and that intellectual yeah. a- aspect was always there, I yeah. suppose. And it seems like what you're speaking about is assurance. You know, when you have that assurance <laughs> that it's actually true, like this, no yeah. matter no matter what evils happen in the present, right. it's it's actually true that God exists, and it's actually true <laughs> that Jesus rose from the dead. Then you know right. you, you can face this. It really is a foundation for being assured in times of trouble and i and yeah. and and the knowledge of church history you're exactly right on that and this is a point that i always try to make is um for people who want advice on apologetics the first thing i say is all of christendom does not rest on your shoulders <laughs> or all of christendom does not <laughs> That's right. does not rest yeah. on your ability because this is something i've i've done myself yeah. where you feel mm-hmm. like if i don't win this argument or if I don't lay this syllogism out perfectly where it can't be denied, <laughs> then, right, yeah. you know, eternity is in the balance. And, right. you know, you know, in some ways it's like, well, yeah, I mean, maybe you could have persuaded someone and you lost that opportunity. But it, it obviously mm-hmm. Christianity has been around for 2,000 years, and it, it survived the persecution of, of the Roman Empire. Okay, it's right. going to survive your sure. blundering. That's right. Uh, an argument online, or an, <laughs> or even if you were even if you were in some public forum like William Lane Craig and you totally blundered right. it, like it, it's gonna be okay. That's right. And you know, some of my very first training with Campus Crusade as a student um, is I, I so appreciate it. I really, oh my goodness, I really believe in being prepared, learning, studying, getting ready, but. I was also taught, and I still believe it, the, the, the phrase was successful witnessing is simply taking the initiative to share Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. So yeah. it, it's in his hands. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, prepare to, yeah, but they, it's in his hands. Yeah, if we can avoid looking foolish, then we, then we should. Yeah, please do. Yes, but if you, you. Do <laughs> fo- if you do look foolish— it's mm-hmm. gonna be all right. You're you haven't. God isn't right. upset with you or what yeah. have you. Yeah. Um. There's a there. If you keep up with statistics and things of the next generation, and this is actually what my blog was about that you published on the stream was the next generation and how apologetics might, um, right. be of uh, help for this. But there seems to be whatever the statistics are. Usually, like seventy to eighty percent of teens walk away from their faith. Mm-hmm. Um, after they leave the home, after high school, that sort of stuff. Um, first of all, how accurate are those? What are there? Is there any modifiers we need to to put put there, in place when we talk about those statistics? Yeah, there probably is. I I um I, I reported on this at the stream. Glenn Stanton at Focus on the Family has uh, written a book, and I'm not going to come up with the name of it, but um, look on the stream for uh, Glenn Stanton, even his name. And um, his uh, what he's he's a researcher for Focus on the Family, and basically he's saying that the uh, the news isn't as bad as we thought because there are these kinds of effects typically in generation after generation, and at least we have not yet reached the point where we can say that this is a permanent walking away. It hasn't been in the past. People tend to come back to church when they. Um, when they have kids, right. but also among young people, um, the numbers of of uh, young people in the college age, for example, whether they're actually students in college or not, who are um, measurably living uh, according to things you would ex- you would associate with a Christian life, um, and and showing some fervency in it, the, the numbers are actually edging slightly up. So. Um, Having said that, there are still students walking away, and the statistics aren't as important as the fact that it might be your son, your daughter, your niece, yeah. your nephew, your um, your your classmate, whatever. Um, and so, you know, you know, am I still st- concerned about students walking away from the faith? Oh my goodness, yeah. It it doesn't have to be, you know, X percent, and it's it's the person. Right. Yeah, we'd be yeah. we'd be concerned if it was one percent or two percent, you know. Yeah. Um, sure. And I, and I think you're right about the statistics and and it it the hype is never a- actually as bad and that just goes with everything. Yeah. I think you know somebody said mm-hmm. there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. So that was. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> yep. wise man. Yep. But uh, uh-huh. and and I think you see that a lot with this when they, people talk about the nuns, not the that's not of the Catholic uh, nuns, no. but the N O N E S and people right. exacerbate the percentage of nuns and what it means and stuff. But they equate it with atheism, and that's not true. But um, there are people. No, who, it's actually moderate or nominal Christianity that. Right. Uh, that's revealing itself for what it is. That, yeah. And I don't think there's any serious dispute among researchers. Is, you know, that's really what's going on there. Right, yeah. It's it's pretty clear that the nuns are religious people who are like spiritual but not religious, or they don't identify right. with a denomination or a specific religion. But if you ask them yeah. point blank, do you believe in God or a higher power, they're most likely going to say yes. Yeah. Um, at least that's what I right. see in the statistics. And, you know, yep. I'm an idiot, so you can take my word with a grain of salt. But... But there are people walking away, uh, young people, and when they do, mm-hmm. what reasons are they giving for walking away? Uh, Christian Smith studied in um, the um, um, soul, uh, soul searching, the spiritual lives of American teenagers, um, along with Melanie Lundquist. And he did that a number of years ago, but I suspect the answer is still the same. That, And when they were asked open-ended questions, the uh, most frequently uh, found class of answers had to do with doubts, intellectual questions, and yeah. so on. Um, you look at Kara Powell and Chap Smith and their work on sticky faith in, uh, out of Fuller uh, Seminary, and they will tell you that they'll add a couple other things like um, uh, young kids who were, who, who were never invited to, quote, big church. So when they're off to on their own, it's like, okay, what is this? I, you know, where's where's the youth group? They, they haven't been properly socialized into what it actually means to go to church, and yet they also say it's a very big deal if students, young people, get a chance to express their doubts and questions at home and in church, so that they can um, process their questions and deal with their doubts and deal with their um, concerns. Um, it makes a big difference if parents. Uh, it makes it above all a huge difference if parents are actually living the faith at home. Yeah, is that? I think that's the triad that makes the biggest difference. Is um, is, is the kind of church experience would be third on the list, I would guess, and then um, the intellectual, the ability to understand it and, and own it as your own faith, and then most of all the parents. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. That would be the 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 triad that you mentioned that I've experienced just personally, and I'd always wonder mm-hmm. if that was just anecdotal or if it was, you know, par for the course. And uh, because right. of uh, myself included, most of my friends growing up, we all went to youth group and things like that. And then when we mm-hmm. all got to college, it was just like pff, free for all. We yeah. <laughs> didn't do, we didn't go to church right. or nothing. And, and that was just mm-hmm. me and most of my friends. And yeah. for for the now we would have fallen into that nun category, but we all still would have said we believed in God. So that's mm-hmm. why I always was suspectful of the nun category as well. Yeah. But right. um, intellectual doubts probably ranked number one. And then, mm-hmm. but something that was common to all people in the triad, triad, triad that I found was right. was uh, complaints about hypocrisy. People always mm-hmm. complained about hypocrisy, and right. and a lot. Like whenever I did come back, I was like, I'm gonna find a very authentic church. Um, Right. And, you know, um, I place, you know, biblical exposition and preaching way up there on the list. Mm-hmm. But if this guy, if this guy's fake and I and it's obvious that he's fake, I, ca- I can't sit in the pew and listen no, to you him. Can't I, do I, that. I, yeah, I think right. young people, uh, I, I don't know, other generations as well as I know my own. That's why I say young people mm-hmm. very, very highly uh, value authenticity. And whenever I speak with right. youth pastors and things like that, and I used to be a youth pastor. They, you know, if anybody ever asked me for advice, I don't know why you would, because again, I'm an idiot. But if you did, my advice would always be, just be real and be authentic. Don't be fake and try to put on a big. They don't care, believe it or not. Millennials do not care about loud music and flashy lights. They much rather uh, have authenticity. Yeah, uh, bad. Because you can get, you know, the church has a hard time competing with the the show. Yeah. Yeah, let's do what we're good at. 
And by the way, with with youth too. Here's the other big one is, and and this falls into intellectual doubts in a way. I mean, in a very definite way. And we've got to deal with it as such, which is doubts about the goodness of Christianity, not just mm-hmm. the truth, especially yeah. with relation to our um, our record with gay rights, marriage, and so on. And the um, where it, where it comes into an into actually love um, people the way Christ loved us, which is without prejudging. Um, but we have got to be able to make the case that Christian morality isn't just what it says in the Bible, but that the Bible is is wise, that it's good, that there are really good reasons why God made, uh, made his uh, standards what he did, that it's good for us, good for communities, good for society, good for children, good for relationships, and some people don't like it that way, some people don't prefer it that way, but that's, um, overall, God knew what he was doing. And the fact that some people don't like what God says is not exactly news. Yeah. Now, I think you're exactly right, I'm glad you bring it up, that it, it, um, it does have a little bit to do with the intellectual side, but it's like Christianity isn't just true, it's also good and beautiful. And I think with... Right. Uh, and as uh, someone who's very much inclined towards apologetics and philosophy, um, it's hard for me to often remember that because, it, yeah. you know, that syllogism isn't going to convert them. It's just not. It might help. It's, it can help. It definitely can help. But it, it's not going to mm-hmm. convert them. Um, right. most, of the, most of the questions I get are always moral. Why did God do this in the Old Testament? Why? Right. Um, you know, I went on an atheist YouTube channel for an interview, and the questions he asked mm. me were almost all. A few of them were epistemological, but m- almost all of them were moral. You know, and yeah. um, and uh, if we've got to be able to make the case that uh, God is good, that His plan is good, and that the gospel is good too. And right. uh, yeah, th- I think you're um, exactly correct. So switching gears here a little bit because the sure. the the stream. It, and, and before we switch, uh, let me first say yeah. thank you to all of our listeners and as well to our patron supporters, especially. Um, it's because of your support that I get to produce free material and put it out there on the interwebs for everybody to see and to spread and defend the truth of Christianity. That's my goal. And uh, so thank you for making that possible to all of our patrons. If you want to become a patron supporter, you can follow the Patreon link in the description below. Appreciate all your support, people. And, of course, again, the links to Tom's website as well as his books will be in the links in the description below as well. Um, so switching gears a little bit here because I, I like the stream. I remember when I first went and checked it out, what I really liked was there was a strong mm-hmm. dose of apologetics. And then it was also yeah. uh, some kind of cultural commentary and uh, mm-hmm. political commentary from a Christian perspective, which I really liked. Um, mm-hmm. That can be done poorly. Um, but um, from what I saw, I really liked it. And so I do recommend the stream. And uh, you do, not only are you um, apologetically inclined or whatever, but you also commentate on cultural and moral yeah. as well as political uh, topics in, in today's world. And so how would you um, recommend that Christians engage in social and political conversations? Some people say, you know, we, you know politics and religion, you got to keep them separate and so that we shouldn't even um, – yeah. uh, Don the task of engaging in such conversations and debates, but uh, clearly you're not of that persuasion. And so I was just wondering, no. uh, how how do you think we should do go about this? Yeah, boy, that's a huge question. Um, yeah, it's a pretty open ended question. It is an open ended one too. Yeah, um, I think first of all, we need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, and. Um, I was on a radio interview once about the book True Reason, and, and the interviewer said, what's the first thing you'd say to a skeptic, to an atheist? And I thought, I said, hello? Yeah, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't want to jump into the what do you say to a person kind of a thing until we've, we've got to understand, we've got to listen. Christians have to understand each other, too, when it comes to, I'm writing about this on the stream actually this week, um, our differences of opinion on, on conservative politics right now. Um, even conservative Christians have differences of opinion oh, on our president, for example. Yeah, for sure. um, and all I'm going to say there is let's listen to each other and let's try to unify around what we have in common before we worry about um, where we disagree. Because the, cause Satan wants to divide us, and that's just one more trick he, he's pulling on us. 
But with with atheists and skeptics, it's really important, first of all, to understand their question. You need to, in my opinion, especially online, understand whether they really have a question. In the sense that if if they're just there to, to pull a challenge, I did a study on this. This is one. Of, this is uh, it was just going to be a blog post, but when it went to thirteen thousand words, I published it as a book on Amazon, called "How Would Jesus Blog: um, Answering Online Adversaries Jesus Way." What I noticed, I did a very careful study of how Jesus answered different groups of people. Um, the crowds, he gave them some basic information, but he didn't fill them in on the answers to what was going on in the parables. You read that in Matthew 13. He did fill in the guy, the disciples. They were all in. He gave them. Right. He gave them the full story. Uh, there were some idle, curious type of people who didn't really, you know, he just kind of said, well, you know, leave the dead to bury their own dead and things like that. But with his adversaries, um, most of the time, what he did is he refused to engage on their terms. He really, really controlled the conversation, and he walked away from a lot of them. Yeah. And even when he stayed with them, like you find in the middle chapters of the book of John, what he was doing was not so much answering their questions. He did some of that, but he also... Um, we've got to be careful with this. We're not Jesus. He, he, he was quick. He, he was willing to point out that um, you're children of the devil, he said. Right. Yeah. Uh, he said to the Pharisees, I will not say that myself to anybody. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's alone. But what I will do sometimes is if I see somebody engaging in really rude behavior, I will say, um, some, I'll point it out to them and say, do you like yourself like that? And I will make it about their behavior rather than about their question, because I think Jesus made that the model. Yeah. If they're not there to, to, to ask a question and, and hear the answer, then I'm not there to answer the question for them. Yeah. Now, is that rude of me? I, I don't think we get anywhere by engaging in these long um, deals where we answer a question, they ask another one. We answer a question, they uh, ignore the they ask another steam one. Steamroller, yeah. I, I don't think we get anywhere that way. Yeah. I think we do better to call people out and just invite them, and I mean invite, but invite them to to, to consider whether they're being um, disingenuous or whether they're being intellectually honest. Yeah, and and, I, and yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, and and what that does, it it I've never had it um, change somebody's heart, obviously, but it's at least protected me from engaging in endless, meaningless conversations, right. of which are an awful lot on Facebook and on yeah. the blogs. Yeah, Endless, meaningless, those are the key words right. there. There's, right. there's no point in it. It's it's not going anywhere. It's not going to end in them changing their right. mind or you changing. And it's really not that hard to tell. Often you can tell from the first question. You know, right. and, it's, and it starts with some, you know, I uh, found myself in a YouTube interview uh, with an atheist, and, and one of the questions mm -hmm. was, um, if if you if God gave you the authority to uh, make this decision, which would you choose? You could have Jesus die for the world's sins by crucifixion, or you could have Jesus die for the sins of the world um, um, through an aneurysm. Which would you choose? It's like do I immediately was like, crap. Why why did I agree to do this? Interview? Yeah, that's right. Because yeah. the question's just stupid. Like it yeah, doesn't. It's just, it, yeah. It's just a gotcha question. And then if you want to play a stupid game, I'll just give you your stupid trophy. I just said aneurysm, and I just said aneurysm, and that was it. Yeah. Like, I, I don't care. It doesn't matter. I'm already regretting that I'm here. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, you, normally, you can't— Normally, though— Yeah, go yeah, ahead. I, was, I, wanna, I, would, I do want to say normally I will give them every chance to, to prove that they're being legitimate before I will conclude they're not. Right. Yeah. I don't want to jump to. I mean, in your case, that question was not a legitimate question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, but I, I don't. I don't assume that quickly. I, I I'll answer questions until I'm pretty right. sure that they're not actually listening. Now I won't answer back to back questions. If you ask a question, I answer it. You well, unless it ha unless it's like a follow up question. If right. you ask me a question, if you say, you know, that question or um, mm -hmm. what about dinosaurs, and I say. Um, what about dinosaurs? And then you say, well, what about um, 
Paul didn't condemn slavery. You know, you're like just bouncing all over the place. Or can right. God lift a yeah. rock so big he can't create a rock so big he can't lift it? And things like that. I'm right. I'm walking away. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, no. let's let's talk about what you raised. Um, did, did you actually hear my answer? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is actually yeah. um, exactly um, what um, – I'm sorry, my mind isn't good on the spot. He wrote the book called Tactics. Uh, Greg, Greg Kokel. Kokel. Yeah, sorry, Greg Kokel yes. recommends. It's called The Steamroller, yeah. and I, I literally just did a video on it. But if, if someone mm -hmm. starts taking that aggressive style of asking you random question after random question, they aren't here for the truth. Okay, and the, and right. I think you should do what mm -hmm. you said is give them, the, give them the benefit of the doubt, even though they clearly already don't deserve it, and say, hold on, yeah. stop. Let's focus on mm -hmm. one question at a time. I'm happy to answer your questions, but let's stay on this one question and give me time right. to answer it. And if they won't do that, then yeah. you do gotta say, I'm sorry, I'm not, you know, walk away. Uh, yeah, I think- And I started by saying it's important for us to listen. I, I think it's okay to ask that they listen to us too. If yeah. they do the stream lawyer thing, they're not listening. Right, Say, so yeah. okay, wait a minute. I don't think you're listening. Can we stick with this? And if they're not gonna do that, then they're, they're demonstrating something about themselves. Right. Yep. Yeah. And there's and there's usually an assumption in the question that you yourself can can question, you know, answer with a mm -hmm. question. Jesus Jesus did that a lot too. Um, but I do like your approach. I'm yeah. going to check out that book you're talking about, blogging okay. like Jesus or something. Is that what you said? How do, how would Jesus blog? How would Jesus blog? There you go. Yes. Maybe I'll I'll yeah, go hunt it down and, and leave that in the description as well. Okay. Um. So. Um. That was really having to do a lot with how to engage skeptics and and things like that. Yeah. Um. But Americans um, just about worship politics. And so yeah. well, there's a lot of political um, lines that are drawn and conversations that happen. And they're not conversations, but conversations that happen. Mm -hmm. um, how should we engage yeah. specifically in political conversations, whether it be about who we're voting for or what we think about right. X, Y, Z? How do we how do we engage with that? Or should we? I think it's. Yeah, I think it's crucial that you understand worldview as well as apologetics, if there is a distinction between them. And worldview is basically how you understand reality. And um, that impacts our understanding of economics, it impacts our understanding of morality, of, of government, of um, uh, even things like uh, crime, punishment, borders, and, um, and so on. And there's a there's a there's a lot of lack of understanding on that out there. Um, this is this is biblical. It's also um, knowing something about the world. Uh, for example, I'll take the question of socialism. Socialism is um, it, it tends to deny private property, and you know, especially in, it, in its more communistic forms. Well, the Ten Commandments, you know, when it says do not steal, that assumes private property. Private property is a pretty important foundation for, for personal freedom. Um, but socialism has some other sides to it, too. It, it tends to assume that people are good. Well, that's not a biblical understanding. The assumption that if, if everybody gets um, the opportunity to work, they will contribute equally to the common good. That just isn't uh, biblical. It's also not true empirically in uh and the uh, i've been to i've been to russia i've been to cuba i've been to communist china um i only looked across the border at north korea you, you don't get in there um very few of us do yeah. um but um communism didn't work and it hasn't worked anywhere and so you look at it and you say that's it's just not true and then there's the other side of it where there's a mathematical side of it. When I was a student at Michigan State, I saw on the uh, on, on a poster there that, that this, I don't know if it's a communist or socialist uh, club on campus was was raising a call for higher wages, uh, lower prices and shorter working hours. And if you think that through, I won't do the math for you. But what that amounts to is we want to be able to buy lots of things that nobody makes. Yeah, um, that doesn't work. And so you got to have your head on about you. The um, that's just one example of a political situation where a, a, a fully informed worldview will really help you make better decisions. Yeah. There's a lot of those, mm -hmm. but um, you can get steamrolled by people who will say, "But 
you know, but what about a free college education? It sounds so good. Well, the problem with it, oh, and free health care. Well, the problem with the free college education and free health care is that they both require large numbers of very highly educated people. You're going to run out of them eventually. Yeah. And, um, and, and you're still talking about impossibilities. Um, and, if you, and if you place them all there, who's going to make the, the good decisions to keep um, technology growing? This is, um, it's, um, it's built on a, on a worldview of, of, I would like to have something and have it be easy. And that's, I'm, I'm, I'm staying on one topic as a worldview example, but that's the kind of thing that we need to be aware of. And it will help us understand how to talk with people. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. um, then, you know, if you're actually engaged in a conversation with someone, I wouldn't suggest you tell them that it's stupid, that socialism is stupid. Ask them questions instead, like, where are we going to find all these highly educated people? Right. How are we going to do this? Is it really historically um, uh, verifiable? Is there any historical evidence that people do contribute to the common good when left to their themselves the way socialism suggests? Yeah. Things like that. Um, yeah. Ask questions. Yeah. So in, in the 2016 election really revealed yeah. um, what you were talking about earlier. You said even conservative Christians have disagreements among themselves. Right. That become very apparent for me, at least, in 2016. It, I mean, everybody always has right. their, their quibbles in-house or whatever. Um, for example, Christians have always debated about the nature of soteriology, eschatology, that sort of stuff. Right. Ter- tertiary, third and theological mm-hmm. debates. I always knew that that was the case. But when it came to morality and and politics, all, at least growing up, I just always felt like, yeah, we all mm-hmm. pretty much align over here. And then in right. thousands, and, and of course I was just naive and, and I was a child, but that's just kind of how mm-hmm. it was perceived. But in 2016, it really became apparent to me um, that there was quite a bit of difference and there really was quite right. a distinction that needed to be made, even against even amongst conservative Christian evangelicals. You can keep going down mm-hmm. the line and the distinction still there. Or uh, for me, it was conservative Christian Baptists, Southern Baptists. Right. It was, right. It, yeah. The divide was very strong. Um, and I'd always been raised that we vote based on principles and based on character and morals and things mm-hmm. like that. Um, it wasn't mm-hmm. always just about the policies Right. And and then in 2016, it pretty much just came all about the policies. And, and everybody right. that I had always been taught by and lectured by growing up were suddenly voting for a man that was, you know, by, by no stretch of the imagination, right. a, like a very moral leader or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, right. and, and it was just put as, well, what are you going to do, vote for Hillary or something like that? So what are some principles, some true universal principles because that's what that was the problem sure. yeah. i thought these principles were universal and uh um, well and so yeah, I, so what are some universal principles we can apply when voting and engaging right. this sort of way the the universal principles but but politics is not that kind of an art um if you're if you're asking what's true then um and and what do i want to be and who am i looking for and, and whom i associate with most closely uh, or marry you know, or do a business partnership and so on. Character, yes. Um, when it comes to a, a choice between two presidential candidates, then you've got a lot of universal principles in play. Um, you've got principles of you know, the abortion question is huge. The, the question of um, national security is very important. And by the way, um, I think the border wall is very moral. You know, some people say it's an immoral thing to do. I say it's immoral to let your nation become weakened to the point where it can no longer give. Right. America is strong. America is able to give. Let's keep strong so that we can keep giving. Not so that we can hoard it, but so that we can keep giving. And if we, uh, if we weaken our national identity to a certain point, we will lose that ability. I don't know where that point is, but let's, let's not go that direction. Um, 
other principles, um, religious freedom, um, the, the, the value of marriage, morality, um, the, um, the, the, and you got to bear in mind the opposition, and you have to weigh your principles. Um, I have friends who are in the Never Trump camp as Christians, and they say, my integrity would never allow me to vote for a person with his demonstrated character as I see it. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, um, that's a principle, and you're weighing that heavily. I respect that. Yeah, I'm not going to say you're on I, the wrong track with your yeah. principle. I will say I'm. I've got a whole set of principles. I don't weigh that one as heavily yeah. as you do. I'm not sure how I can. I, I can't judge you wrong for that. I don't. I don't know how I can do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I can say I disagree with you. I've got different opinions on this, and I think you're making a mistake politically, and so on. But um, know your principles and decide how you're going to weigh them, um, especially with respect to not only who you're voting for, but who you're voting to protect the country from, mm-hmm. because there are people who are running for office who have some very, very bad, and I would suggest even evil ideas in mind. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Um, and, and I think you were touching on something that I think is very both interesting and weird to me. And so it really became apparent mm-hmm. to me, I'd always kind of thought of it, thought it, and then it really became apparent to me well, it became apparent apparent to me in the 2016 election, but then also whenever, I believe his name is Mark Galley, wrote that article for yes. Christianity Today. I did a response to that because it drove me so nuts. Um, yeah, but, written, uh, <laughs> I'm working that one really hard at the stream right now. Yeah, that so was – please that go, was, keep going. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so first of all, a principle yeah. that you were talking about that just made me think back to that article was we mm-hmm. shouldn't paint our political opponents as evil – or, or however you were wording that, which is something uh, he clearly did in that article, which was if you are yeah. an evangelical Trump supporter, he didn't question your decision making. He questioned your loyalty to God. And it was like, yeah, OK, if that's what you have to base your argument on, then I already know that you're full of crap. But uh, okay. uh, huh? it, yeah, sometimes yeah. I just kind of speak my mind here. Um, there you go. <laughs> But also, it, it came back to that integrity thing that you said, and that is the thing I I always hear from um, Christian evangelical Christian conservative evangelicals who refuse mm-hmm. support for Trump uh, in the 2016 right. election and in the 2020 election. Apparently, mm-hmm. is that they're very concerned about their integrity, mm-hmm. or actually, the term that I always hear isn't integrity, but their witness, and that was the term that. Galley used. That's the one Galley me. used, right? And that's the yes. one I often hear from from people I very much respect and love, and and I follow right. on just about everything else. And I'm like, I'm not going with you here. Okay. And the reason I'm not going there right. is actually for a moral reason. And I think, and I say this softly, I just can't think of another word to use. It's almost mm-hmm. selfish. It's almost selfish yeah. because I vote yeah. on principles that I think, and for policies, and for people that I think are going to do the, and I'm, this isn't the uh, wholeness of my moral uh, philosophy, but I vote based on, mm-hmm. what, on what I think is going to be good for everybody and what's going to be yeah. good for my neighbor, and not just because, not just for what's going to give me uh, mm-hmm. peace of mind. Right. You know what right. I mean? And so yeah, it really bothers me. It, yeah. it really bothers me when people say that because it's like, well, you're just focusing on yourself. I I am willing to vote for somebody like Donald Trump, who I agree mm-hmm. has moral failures and at least in the mm-hmm. past and possibly in the present that's up for debate i'm willing to vote for yeah. somebody like that for the sake of the pro-life movement to to mm-hmm. end abortion or for the sake of these other moral things that we do i'm willing to take that heat because yeah. i think the good is going to be much better um and that's yeah. really painting myself in a good picture i know but um, that's how no, i feel about that, it yeah and by the way um as far as where donald trump is now i urge you to um there's a there's a circle of Christians that he's invited to to gather around him and pray. They had a meeting in Miami a couple of weeks ago. I urge you to look up what they are saying about those meetings and not necessarily what other people are saying about them on those meetings. And what you will find is that they are there on his invitation to speak the truth as they understand it to him, and he is listening. Um, just check it out in the media, but, but, but listen to what they're saying and don't go in there just, um, assuming that they're being self-serving because these are Christian leaders. 
Um, and, and, and also with respect to, to what Mark Galley said about our Christian witness, I, um, I, I, don't, I don't agree with that one bit. And here's why. What he did there was he threw a whole lot of Christians under the bus. And, and basically invited the rest of the world to, to look at us and go, you know, there's a bunch of Christian idiots out there. They're really just morally idiots or they're political idiots and so on. And, and that's supposed to help our witness. Right. That's, that's, that's disunifying. Jesus said they'll know we're Christians by our love for one another. What, he, what I wish people would do is to say, okay, We've all got Christian principles here. We weight them differently. I can't vote for Trump in my integrity because um, I weight that really highly, uh, you know, it, it, for the person who says that. But I, I firmly support the fact that other people care about things like life and religious freedom and, and the, the health of our economy without diving into socialism. It's... Um, Let's support one another in our witness. Let's not throw each other under the bus that way. I, I would, I would and, and besides, and he was wrong anyway too. And he said the facts are unambiguous. Trump did wrong, and he needs to be removed by impeachment. Yeah, he didn't provide um, any no, evidence. Trump for it. Is just wrong. It's not unambiguous. Okay, that's that's too easy. But keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean he 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 literally just said that, and then he went right on. Literally, the next right. sentence was yeah. comparing Trump to uh, uh, Clinton in in ninety two or whenever that was. I was just being right. born, but uh, <laughs> uh -huh. so so you mentioned um, not throwing each other under the bus and mm -hmm. not not. I wouldn't. And he was throwing his fellow Christians, not only his fellow Christians, but his fellow conservative evangelical Christians under the bus. Like we're way down the ladder here, and he's throwing them under the bus. I, I wouldn't do that to Christians who were, and maybe some people might disagree with me here, but I wouldn't do that to Christians who are ver voting for a Democrat. You know, like mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the argumentation that he was using. Is what I'm saying. Um, I, I would never suggest that if you're a Christian and you voted for a Democrat, that you, I'm going to question your loyalty to God. I'm not. I think mm -hmm. you're wildly wrong, but just on yeah. a factual, intellectual. And political basis, like I'm not going to say, oh, the only way you could do that is if you don't really love God, or if you're not a real Christian. If someone has to say you're not a real Christian to support their argument, they're they don't they either don't know what they're talking about or they're lying to you, and and that should right. be obvious. And so I wouldn't even say that to Christians who vote Democrat. And I always make a point to say that. And I'm the person, yeah. and I'm the person saying, sure. I'm the person saying Christians should vote. Or uh, Christians f should at least feel justified in voting, or morally justified in voting for Trump. So I'm supposed to be the, yeah. the crazy one, and and I'm uh -huh. the uh, the non the non inclusive one, the one that's uh -huh. you know judgmental yeah. and a bigot and everything. But I'm not even mm -hmm. saying that to my fellow Christians who vote for Democrats, and I always and I always right. make a point to point that out. It's it's fellow. Jesus, uh, yeah, he he didn't say they'll know who we're, we're Christians by who we vote for. Um, yeah. I, I do think it's wrong to have a moral, or I, I, mean, I think it's possible rather to have a wrong moral opinion, and I certain, I think certain votes reflect wrong moral opinions, and I think that's damaging. It's, it's, it's harmful and, and, and wrong, but I, I agree with you that does not determine whether they're a believer in Christ. Just det determines perhaps whether they're uh, well studied or whether they're consistent in the faith and, and things like that. Yeah, and, and and when you make statements like he said, even though he's not explicitly saying it, it leaves the impression that you're conditioning salvation based on a, a vote or, yeah, uh, or a political opinion. It's just crazy. Like I say, he's not yeah. saying it explicitly, but it's it sure right. leaves that taste in your mouth. But yeah. uh, anyway, Tom, thanks so much for joining me. We really um, uh, tackled a lot of different subjects from apologetics and doubt yeah. and faith and, and culture mm -hmm. and things like that. I uh, really appreciate you joining me uh, to have this conversation. Take the time out of your day. I'm sure you got a lot of things going on, so I appreciate it. Um, again, to the listener, thanks so much for joining us and uh, listening all this time. And, of course, uh, thank you to our patrons for all your support because of what you do. I get to uh, produce free material like this out on the interwebs and um, 
spread the truth of and defend the truth of Christianity, as well as engage with some cultural ideas and things like that every once in a while. And so thanks so much for your support. If you want to watch the bonus segment, Five More Minutes with Tom Gilson, you can follow the Patreon link in the description uh, that I just mentioned and become a patron supporter and get access to not only that bonus segment, but all of our bonus segments as well. Early content and uh, bonus, other bonus content, things like that, over at our Patreon website. So thanks so much again to our listeners. Tom, thanks so much for joining me, sir. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. It's been a, been a real joy.